Hello, it's Devlin from Motorwork, and today we're going to be doing a buyer's guide on the frankly awesome but slightly troubled Land Rover Defender. We're going to cover them from 1983, from when they were still called 90s and 110s, up until the last generation of the Defender, and we're going to cover all their engines, their options, and what to look out for when buying one of these. And just as a heads up and a fair warning, you will likely be able to play a drinking game off of how many times I say the word rust. It is just one of the problems with these things, but otherwise they are awesome little rigs. I drove it up here, I've had a great time filming this truck. So of course I gave away my lead, but we may as well jump right into it. Before you even start a Defender, before you even open the hood, walk around a Defender and look for rust. And unless it's got 10 miles on it, you're probably gonna find some. That isn't to say that it should run away from it, but you wanna be very, very sure of where that rust is, how bad the rust is, and how much you wanna spend fixing it or how much it worries you that it's there. They're not that hard to fix because there are so many replacement parts and such a huge following on people who help replace them that you can fix the rust on these things. It's not world ending that it's there. You just have to budget it and make sure that it's part of your bargaining chip when you're looking at one of these because that will affect your ownership of it if it has rust. So let's look at some of the common places right away. On the side of the truck, there's a whole bunch of places you want to check. Along here on the older versions before the 2000 TD5 generation, there used to be brackets behind these panels that were for the seat belts in the back. And what you want to check for is any bubbling coming from inside because what they'll happen is they're, rot they're metal on aluminum panels and they'll rust out from the inside creating a problem here. So you want to knock on this making sure that everything sounds like metal, that it doesn't sound like it's filler, that there's no bubbles, that there's no creasing on this panel here. You can replace it, but it's a huge panel to have to, as well as these runners. These ones are pretty clean on the TD5s. The older generations had like a rain gutter thing and some welds that were along the sides here constantly prone for rusting out. And if you see a little bit of rust here, you'll actually probably want to go inside and take the trim off and see if it's rusting on the inside because that's usually where the greater amount of rust is when it's on the inside if this panel here, this little seam on the truck, has any kind of rust showing through. Of course the outer skin on Defenders are aluminum, but the doors are aluminum over a steel frame. Most of the truck is, but the doors are susceptible because of that to having rust coming through them. So what you want to do is open the door up and look for any patching here. You want to look for any rust along the bottom here. Anywhere where it's been cut, welded, seamed, or currently has rust that will need to have that done. Honestly, it's probably easiest to find just another door if you have some rust, but you want to check all along the bottom seam here. You want to make sure there's no corrosion on the hinges, you want to make sure that there's no sag, and you want to make sure there's no fatigue, that the door doesn't have an excessive amount of play if you push up and down on it. The fenders, I mean, checker plating is usually a terrible sign. It usually means it's hiding something. We put this on. It was a couple weeks ago that we put this on for the customer, so we happen to know underneath it is clean. But if you see checker plating, you want to get behind it and see if you can see the metal and see if there's corrosion starting. Sometimes it'll even be bubbling out of the top of the checker plating and you'll be able to see just a little bit of the paint starting to come up. But if, if it has checker plating, that's usually nine times out of 10 hiding something. The only reason we know this one's solid is because we put this on two or three weeks ago. Even looking at this roof seam here, there's a little bit of bubbling starting there. This front panel, this particular section here, the water runs off the window into this rain trap and then towards this seam with a foam piece in there constantly known for having rust here. So this one's really clean. There's no bubbling, there's no, there's no damage signs at all. But that's a really common area. You can get pieces that can fix it to replace it, but it's quite a job to do. If you can find one without rust in the first place, that's really the way you want to have it. Moving to the front of the truck, you want to check the bumpers. These are actually really known for rusting. We had one come through the shop probably a couple months ago when we hit it with a pressure washer, the end cap just came off. It was so corroded inside of there. You're going to want to grab an old set of clothes when you look at a Defender because you want to crawl underneath it, you want to hit stuff with hammers, you want to pull on things, and you want to check under here to make sure that it's all solid. The mounting points here are solid on this truck, this bumper's solid, there's no corrosion, you can feel on the bottom that it's all metal. Looking through the grill, you can see that the intercooler has been replaced, that's because the original one to this truck was damaged. Through the grill, you want to make sure that both the intercooler and the rad look like they're in good shape, there's not a bunch of debris in them, if there's a bunch of uh, mud and muck in them, the engines are known for overheating. They need their cooling systems, especially the later Ford engines. So if there's a bunch of muck on the front of these things, make sure that you get it cleaned off and really kind of decide if it was covered like that when you went to look at it, how often was that cleaned when the last owner had it and how hot has that engine been? Because cooling on these little TDIs, especially those later Ford engines, the 2.4s and the 2.2s, really like their cooling systems if they were plugged up because they weren't being cared for by the last owner. That might be something you'll have to worry about like a head gasket issue down the road. Now that we've checked this, let's head to the back of the car and check the door. There's a couple more things to look for there, and as well, that rear cross member. 
very big problem with these vans. You could probably spend as much time at the back of this truck as you will on the rest of it because there are so many seams, welds, rivets, points of water ingress that could happen that you really want to be careful. You also want to make sure that when you open this door, because it carries the wheel, and that's been bouncing around since this thing was built, sometimes that'll fatigue the hinges. That's more of a problem on the earlier ones. These later TD5 hinges are really quite strong. You want to make sure that it doesn't feel like it has any play. This one doesn't, and it also closes quite well. It still has a little bit of force to it. You know you have to give it a bit of a push, but it will close, it'll seal up. It's a, it's a solid door. But around every single rivet, bolt, nut that you can see on the back of this thing, you want to look for any bubbling or corrosion. And then you're going to move down to the good old rear cross member. This is probably the single most common point for rust on a Defender because everything that the wheels kick backwards get caught up in here. You can see it's starting to brown up here. We're gonna put it on a hoist just so you can see it better because we wanna get a camera up under there with a big light to show you what you're looking for. So we won't be doing that here. But at this point, I would say you've walked around it, you're starting to see some bubbling, even if you're not. You wanna look underneath and see if this has been replaced. It's a very common thing to fix. If this has been replaced, it's not actually a bad thing. You wanna just look at how it was replaced and whether it'll need to be done again. But this will be a great first impression. If this is just completely corroded, completely rusting through, it's very likely it's worse underneath. So we've opened the door here. What you wanna do is try to pull this carpet up and take a look under there to see the floor and the bulkhead. Don't feel bad about moving someone's carpet on an air truck or like really investigating because whether or not it's yours yet, it might become yours and then it'll be your problem. So you wanna pull that up and see if there's any rust on the floor, anything on the bulkhead that would cause you concern. You're also gonna be looking at it from the bottom, but you wanna see it from the inside. On top of that, here, I mean, I know this one is good, so I'm not gonna pull it off, but there's little 10 millimeter bolts that hold it down. Pull that carpet up, take a look to see if this is solid. If the water gets in through the door, it'll rust this out or it'll come up from the bottom and rust this out. And in either case, this is a hard part to replace. You don't wanna be doing that. Pull up the carpets on the floor, pull up the carpets on the seat housing. You wanna make sure that when you pay money for this thing, you know exactly what shape it's in. And here we are under the hood of this truck. This one has a five cylinder turbocharged direct injection diesel engine with an ECU under the seat that controls it. This was really a boost in power. It was a, it was a nice increase in drivability. It really helped with the emissions rating of these trucks and they're great little power units and quite reliable. There's a couple of things that go wrong with them, but we'll start at the original engine. So when the Defender came out in 1983, it wasn't called a Defender yet. It was a 90 and a 110, depending on wheelbase. You had a 2.25 liter gas engine and a 2.25 liter diesel engine. Collectively, they made 139 horsepower and anything with that low of a horsepower rating is definitely reliable, not very fast. Those things are great, but slow. Later on, you had a 2.5 liter gas and diesel engine. Both of those were also very reliable, except for up until about 1990, that 2.5 liter diesel engine sometimes came to option with a turbocharger. Well, it was a naturally aspirated engine with a turbocharger fitted to it, and sometimes those didn't work that well. So if you do find an earlier pre-1990 non-200 TDI diesel turbo, you might want to avoid it or see if it's been converted to a later engine. If it's converted to a later engine, you've got a bulletproof little truck there, go and have fun with it. But those early two and a half liter turbocharged engines have been known to have a fair amount of issues that they don't really like their turbochargers stuck to them. Then there came the 200 TDI and the 300 TDI. The 300 TDI is the same displacement as the 200 TDI. It was just a later gen version to have better emissions. Both of them are great engines. They're fairly reliable. Sometimes they have head gasket issues or overheating issues. That's where you want to check the cooling system. You want to make sure that they stay within temperatures and they don't smoke out the back. But honestly, they're pretty reliable engines with that older style gearbox as well. Reliable shifting means it's a good unit. No noises coming from it means it's a good unit. They're pretty robust. The engines under these things are really not their problems. And one person I saw a video of made a funny statement that the engine bay is not usually that rusty because it was always coated by oil from the engine leaking. Leaks are fairly common. And then we're here at the TD5. The TD5 is a great engine. It drives really nice, makes good power, and you can map them like this one. It makes a great amount of power, really boogies the thing along. But there's a couple things you want to look out for, and this one actually had a couple of them. Fuel pressure regulator at the back of the engine is known to leak. I'll try to shine a camera on it and overlay that here. They're known to leak. We had to fix that one. They're also known to have a problem with their fuel injector wiring harness cracking. The casing around the wires cracks and then oil pressure seeps up the wiring harness into the ECU in your cab. And uh, we know this because this one had it. That's what we replaced. We replaced the ECU when we remapped it and we also replaced the wiring harness. But what you have to do is you wanna take that seat off and this might sound extreme, but if it's running, if it's idling rough, 
you really want to take that seat off and check the plug to the ECU to see if it has oil coming out of it because your ECU might be full of oil. Strange statement to say, but it's a TD5 thing. Other than the fuel pressure regulator and that injector harness problem, they're really quite robust engines. I mean, like any diesel engine, make sure the glow plugs work, make sure that it starts and idles when it's happy, make sure that it has good fuel to it, that it spools when you drive it and it boosts when you're going along, but there's not too much to check. These TD5s are really reliable. The later Ford engines that were the 2.2s and the 2.4s, they're also great little units. I was saying that the 2.2 and 2.4 like their cooling system, so you want to make sure that the rad and the air conditioning condenser and the intercooler are all clear of any mud and debris. But honestly, they're pretty reliable engines as well. The drivetrains and defenders are really quite robust, so you want to make sure it just starts, idles, drives well. Fuel filters are important on those newer engines as well as the DPF systems fitted to the later 2.2s. Make sure that it's all functioning well or possibly have it tuned off, but that's not something we can condone. No matter what engine you have, you're going to look around the engine bay. You want to check your oil level. You want to check your coolant level. You want to check your power steering level if it has it, if it's not an earlier one. You want to make sure that you have every single thing under here looks okay. A little bit of a leak is fairly common. You're going to notice some sort of signs of oil seeping. But you want to make sure that there's no rust on the wheel arches, that there's no rust on the frame rails. Looking around, making sure all the fluids are good and just making sure it generally looks like it's been well cared for. You see a bunch of dry cracking hoses, bolts in the end of vacuum lines to make sure that it just doesn't do whatever it was doing at the time that they put that in there. You just wanna make sure that it looks like it was well cared for. I mean, in, under this engine bay, it looks clean. I can see every fluid level, I've checked them all. It's a, it's a solid setup. You just really wanna get a set of confidence. Whether or not the engines themselves are reliable, they still require maintenance. So one of the things you want to check out for on a Defender is the transfer case and the center diff lock. The center diff lock connects the rear and the front wheels together, and that means on pavement it'll kind of like bind and hop a little bit. So when you're driving around with it unlocked, you're full-time all-wheel drive, and it'll kind of slip and allow you to drive around. But realistically, if you get stuck in one wheels on a patch of ice, you're one-wheel drive. You have two open front, two open differentials and an open transfer case. It's a one-wheel drive technically. When you put the center diff lock on, that locks the front and rear axles and then you're at least two wheel drive unless you upgrade the front and rear differentials. So what you want to do is you want to slide it over to the left and see a little light on the center, the dashboard that's going to show you that your center diff light comes on. And it's very possible it won't work. This one doesn't work. The linkages don't get used very much when these aren't used for off-roading. So that center diff lock never really gets function tested, the linkage wears out, something gets seized, and just like this truck, you can wiggle it back and forth. And if I slam it over to the left, I can briefly get the light to come on. It's a linkage fix you can get, but it will not engage the center diff lock. Just something you'll want to check out for. Next, you want to check out low range. You want to put it forward into neutral. And then if you're having trouble getting it into low range, what I found with this truck is as I'm pushing into low range, let the truck roll or if it's on flat ground, slightly pull up the clutch a little bit while you're pushing it into low range and it might engage. Now that you're in low range, you'll know this because when you pull it out in first gear, you'll be doing such a slow speed. And if you try to rev it out, you really won't move that much faster. Like this is probably three, 4,000 RPM now. But this truck, and I'm gonna have to actually talk to the other customer about this, is kicking itself out of low range. So that's something I wanna talk to them. The linkage between the center diff lock and low range really doesn't seem to work that well. And I just wanna let them know because, well, that's kind of what a Defender's for, no? So that's one of the reasons we recommend highly that you should check out the transfer case on this truck because we just figured out that this truck doesn't work. All right, we've got the truck up on a hoist. As I said, you can do this if you just get an old set of clothes, crawl underneath it. You're definitely gonna want to because the underside is where the rust is gonna be shown. We're gonna do it on a hoist just so I can get better shots and better explain what I'm pointing out so that you know what to look for. So we'll go under here first. One of the oddities of the Defender is that they're actually set up the frames for both left and right hand drive. So you'll see a lot of empty brackets that don't have anything on them. That's because in this case where this, I think the pitman arm is, it would hook up the other way if the steering box was on the other side. The problem is things like the steering box bolt holes are inside of the frame rails for both sides. Those can collect dirt and rust. So you want to look up on the frame rails here. You want to look on any of these brackets that don't have anything on them. You want to look on the lower side of the car. This vehicle has had the entire steering system replaced. So all the ball joints, all of the bushings are all new and replaced. So it looks really clean under here. You'll even see on the steering knuckle on the driver side in this case has something missing because that's where an arm would have gone from the steering if it was left-hand drive. But you want to make sure the suspension components, they're super easy to see and visible because it's a fairly open car and it's quite high off the ground. 
check for things like that. The shocks, I mean, all four shocks in this are replaced as well as the steering stabilizer shocks. There's quite a few options that you can see that let you know this car was well serviced. And the front of the truck, I mean, browning on the bottom of a frame, it happens on basically every car sold in Canada if it drives here at all you're gonna see browning on the frame. So these larger pieces of metal, these larger components that have that, isn't as much of a concern as what we'll show you in the back. So we'll move to the back of the car now. I've stopped us in the middle because I wanted to show off these uprights that come off the frames that hold the body on, their body mounts. They're very susceptible to rust. Luckily this truck actually has a pair of mud flaps and a very good or well sealed wheel arch that keeps everything away from them. But you wanna check these for rust because they're very susceptible to having dirt, rocks and uh, moisture collecting them. They rust out and then your body mounts are gone. Leaks are fairly common on these. We noticed on this truck that the clutch master cylinder and the clutch slave cylinder both failed. We noticed fluid leaking out of the bottom of it here. And there's some rear main seal leaks that we can see as well as the transfer case is a bit of a leak. Those might be concerns for you, but honestly, it's quite likely that a Land Rover is going to leak. So it's up to you on how important a clean driveway is and how often you'll have the truck, even if it doesn't leak when you buy it. It's fairly likely that it's going to leak in your ownership. So it's important to you when you're looking at it, how important that is to you. Now we'll go to the back. So this is where the biggest problem happens. Both the front and the rear wheels kick all of the salt, rock, snow, anything that this thing's driving through into the back. And what you can see quite commonly, this is a short wheelbase, so it doesn't have the extension over the rear axle that a long wheelbase would have. But if this rear cross member, which catches everything that gets thrown up at it, has been replaced, you will notice there's two ways to replace it. You can either cut it right at the back cross member, or you can cut it here just after the arch on the wheels. If you have it replaced farther in, it's a better setup because that gives you a greater amount of new metal. So if you do see it replaced or you're going to budget for replacing it, go the extra mile and replace the full component. This one is actually starting to get quite a bit of rust on the bottom of the gas tank and I'm starting to see it right here in the frame rail that connects to the rear cross member. It's something you want to look out for when you're looking at these trucks because rust is very common. There's a cross member up here as well that is for the rear or just in front of the rear axle very susceptible you want to make sure that you can see there's metal strong metal on it there's no corrosion on the inside of the frames if you bring a hammer with you you can actually hit on anything that looks soft because if it is soft it's a big repair that you're going to have to do so any cross or any brace that goes from the front of the back to this truck that holds up the body that holds up um, the center of the frame holds any components you want to be checking the last thing is up here and it's very awkward to get to here is the linkage for the low range and the center diff lock. You can see that any of the any salt, any road grime is gonna get up in there. And so if that doesn't get used in the way that it should get used, that's what causes it not to function. And we talked about this truck not working. And it's quite awkward to get to. We often see people coming on forums, going through the floor, coming up through the bottom. It's the linkage that's tucked way up in here that if you can get one that has a working four wheel drive linkage and low range linkage, it's much easier to repair then when you have to come out to the bottom of this car and make it work from down here. That is another thing that if you notice it doesn't work before you go underneath it, you can look up here, see if anything is broken, see if anything is seized and get someone else to try to move it and see what might be the cause. But that's what we, that, that's what we have to repair on this one to get the center diff lock and the low range working again. So kind of an awkward little fix. As I said at the beginning of this video, you can make a drinking game on how many times I say rust, but it is truly what you want to be checking out for. Now that we've gone underneath it, we'll go take it for a drive if you're happy with what you see when you're on the ground. And that'll be all you have to look for in a Land Rover Defender. So when you get behind the wheel of a Defender, if you haven't been in one in a while, it might seem like a strange experience. It's very visceral. This doesn't really drive like anything else on the road. They're, they're unique. This one's a short wheelbase, so it's quite bouncy. It's quite... I wouldn't say direct because the steering in a Defender is very lazy, where at the same time the truck turns in quite well if you yank on the wheel because it's a short wheelbase. It's a different driving experience, but that's not really what you're looking for. If you're looking at a Defender, you've likely driven one. So let's talk about what you're looking for. Well, the five-speed manual transmissions are pretty robust. What you want to look for is make sure that they shift through all five gears correctly. Same with the six speeds, they're fairly robust. The only time you'd ever really worry about it is if they've been doing a lot of work, like towing and such. Sometimes when they're colder, they're a little notchier to shift, so make sure you get the car up to temperature to make sure that they shift smoothly when they're warm. If they're still very notchy when they're warm, and kind of hard to get in and out of gear from like first, second, and third, maybe it's something you'll have to look into. Make sure that if you have a turbo diesel that you're looking at, you can roll into it and it does build boost. 
When it builds boost and you're rolling into it, make sure that any smoke you do see is only black smoke. It's unfortunate, but it's a diesel. That's what happens. They're just going to blow and emit some smoke. Just make sure it's not blue or white smoke. Blue smoke could quite likely be valve stems. These diesel engines are known for it in most of the generations, mostly the 300 and the 200 TDIs. The TD5s aren't really known for that as much. And if you see white smoke, well, that's possibly a head gasket, something you want to look out for as well. So you want to make sure there's no other smoke than black smoke if you're driving a gas or diesel powered one, just to make sure that it's running well. Sometimes you'll find a truck that's like this one, which has a tune on it, and it's actually got two selectable map positions, one for a fuel economy position and one for a power position. The power position really wakes this thing up. It's a lot more pokey than I was expecting a Defender to be. You just want to make sure that if the, the vehicle you're looking at does have a remap, that the company's reputable, that you can see reviews, you can see they've been around for a while, that it isn't their first truck they've ever tuned. Make sure that the Defender has some name behind it. Other than that, when you're driving it, you want to accelerate and see if it pulls. If I let go of the wheel on this one and I accelerate, we stay straight. If I let go of the wheel on this one and I brake, we stay straight. That shows that the suspension components and the steering components are all in good shape. You want to make sure that it doesn't seem to pull in either direction. If it does, it's quite likely going to need some front end components and an alignment. Not the worst in the world, but something you'll have to fix. When it's idling, does it idle smoothly? Sometimes there's misfire issues, especially on these TD5s when that injector wiring harness gets uh, broken and starts leaving oil in the ECU. It can cause a misfire and rough running, so you can have a pretty clear indication as to whether or not that issue is happening. Like with any vehicle, you want to check the electrics. I realize that Defenders don't have very many. I mean, for my dials, I've got a fuel gauge, a clock, a temperature gauge, and a speedometer. So make sure those are all working. As well as the blower motor, cigarette lighter, just little things that you want to make sure are all functioning. Make sure that when you turn in, there's no dead zone in the steering or it's consistent going left to right, that the effort doesn't change. Make sure that when you turn it as well, you don't hear a power steering whine. That's a very common issue. So you just want to make sure you do tight turns, full turns on the steering input. There's no whining or groaning from anything like that. Same with any noise from the diff when you get on it, when you're decelerating, when you're accelerating. Just driving it around, listening for any mechanical whirs or noises. Luckily, because this thing's so simple, you're not really checking interior electrics. You're checking the mechanicals from the drivetrain. And these are pretty robust. I mean, this thing's tons of fun. It has a great feel to it. They're kind of cool little trucks. Oui.